So, um, let's take a step back and have a look at what the purpose of a operating system is in general. So, for one thing is, if you have a, any kind of computer, be it a mobile phone or a desktop PC or whatever, then this computer consists of a bunch of hardware resources, which can be the CPU or devices, and there are also virtualized software resources, so like for instance a file system, which is not something really on disk, because on the disk you just have blocks of data, and you have some additional software resource that is making sense of these blocks and presenting them to you in a way that, that looks like a file. Um, another purpose of an operating system is that users should have some kind of easy to use interface to access these resources. So in addition to managing the resources and seeing that not too many people are using the same resource uh, so you don't get overload, um, an operating system provides some kind of an interface. And the file system is pretty much an interface that gives you an easy to use look at the blocks on the disk because you don't want to go down there and write down uh, or communicate with the disk directly but what you, what you want to have is open an editor, edit a file and save it to disk and you don't care about what's going on underneath. Um, then if you have a look at modern CPU architectures, uh, especially x86 but, but not uh, only, then you will see that hardware usually provides certain privileged and unprivileged hardware operations and privileged operations are the ones that only a subset of the software that's running in your system is allowed to do. And these are especially kernel operations. And if you have x86, then you have these uh, four privileged rings, ring 0, 1, 2, and 3. And usually software is only running in ring, v ring 0 and ring 3. And ring 0 is the one where you can do anything, and this is where the kernel runs in. Whereas in ring 3, you are restricted with what you can do. So you can still do computations on the CPU, but you're still not allowed to do special things like writing to certain I.O. ports to access a device. You're not allowed to disable interrupts. You're not allowed to modify the page table. These are all the operations the operating system needs to do for you. Um, and so this is what, what an operating system basically does. It needs to perform privileged operations when they are necessary and prevent user applications from doing that. And the most common example for Software parts of the operating system that try to do this are device drivers, which of course need to disable interrupts at certain points in time, they need to access the hardware, and therefore there's, there's some part of the device driver which usually needs to run inside the operating system. Um, and as a last part, as we're talking about secure system uh, systems in the sound school, is that an operating system also provides a separation between processes be uh, because you want user applications to run independently and not have access to each other's data if they don't explicitly allow it. This basically means that if you have two users r working on the same machine, then you don't want user A from accessing the data of user B. So that's the operating system's job to isolate the users or the processes from each other. And on the other hand, sometimes you want user A and user B to communicate because, for instance, they're working on a shared file and both need the um, possibility to edit this file. So at some points you want to allow cooperation, which makes the whole process of separating concerns uh, harder because in addition to isolation, isolation, you also need to have mechanisms that allow you to collaborate. Um, if we have a look at a traditional monolithic kernel, um, such as Linux, then uh, all these purposes go into some scheme like this. Um, so, back to monolithic kernels. Um, we already covered the system call interface, which is there for user applications to get some easy access to the hardware resources. And on the other part, at the lower part of the spectrum, um, we have the layer in the monolithic kernel that's responsible to managing hardware access directly. So, this is the part that directly talks to the hardware in your computer. And then in between we have different things that kind of ease working with uh, the system. Like there are file systems, file system implementations, there's networking over here, uh, both of which in the end access a device driver which goes to the hardware directly. And then uh, over here on the right side we have processes, scheduling and communication, memory management, all of the which is responsible for implementing isolation between applications. So this, the, the right part is for implementing security. 
And the whole idea of a monolithic kernel is that everything runs within this one blob, which is why it's called monolith, as I said. So we see a couple of uh, issues with this uh, approach. And for one, there's, there are a couple of security issues. So all these components I just showed you are running in privileged mode. So everything is running in privileged processor mode, and all code that's running in there is allowed to perform privileged operations. So as you know, device drivers, for instance, are usually dynamically loaded modules that come from some arbitrary vendor. And what you do is you go to the internet, download your device driver, load it into your kernel, and then it's running in privileged mode, and you have no control over what it's doing in there. So if someone ships you a malicious driver which tries to read out your data and send it to someone else, then he can easily do it. Um, the next thing is that there's some kind of uh, access to all kernel data in all modules. So even if your graphics cards driver does not need any access to the file system, it still has this access because it's all running in privileged mode in the same address space and there is no isolation between these components. Um, and yeah, module lo loading also has the opportunity to add any kind of code in your system, wh whatever your attacker wants. Um, the next thing is that Given that all these components run within this single huge block within a privileged mode, uh, we run into resilience issues. If you have a look at a modern operating system, then about 75% of this code are device drivers. And device drivers are well known to be the uh, most buggy kind of software that you see in systems development. Uh, mostly because the people who write device drivers are not the people who write operating systems, but they are the people who build devices. And so that they really know about the intricacies of how a device works and what it does, but uh, they're not as good in understanding the um, interactions between their device driver code and the rest of the system. And so what you get is you have this highly error-prone device driver which runs inside your blob and has access to all kernel data and if this driver fails it can take down your whole system. Um, and on the last part, um, in a monolithic kernel you also have software level issues. It's like, uh, also goes into the, the, the direction that everyone can access all data and there's no clean separation of concerns and if you want to maintain a monolithic microkernel this ends up in a software engineering nightmare and um, what do you do with all this complexity I think I, I would claim no one in the Linux kernel community really uh, understands all the subsystems of the Linux kernel and how they interact with each other and this complexity is hard to manage and from a software engineer perspective you don't want this actually um, also, if you have embedded systems which have scarcer resources, then monolithic kernel makes it harder to uh, strip it down to the point where it runs on these scarce resources. Of course, Linux has come a long way. Linux is running on a lot of embedded platforms these days. However, if you have a look at what people consider an embedded platform these days, then your mobile phone basically is just a small PC. And your mobile phone is most probably more powerful than the PC you had 10 years ago. So the question arises, is this really still an embedded system with sparse resources running Linux, or is this just another commodity PC? Um, in order to address all these issues I just talked about, um, some people came up with an alternative design, which is called microkernels. And the general idea of a microkernel is that you come up with an operating system kernel that is minimized and only contains uh, this functionality that you really need to have inside the kernel. And in general, the argument goes like this. Well, if, if your kernel becomes smaller and smaller, then of course it becomes less error prone, because usually the larger your software project goes, the more errors you have in it. So if you shrink down the size of your project, uh, you have less errors. Um, you will commonly hear this referred to as having a small trusted computing base which is kind of uh, an important term in terms of security. Um, the trust computing base is basically the amount of software you need to trust in order to run your application. So suppose you're running your online banking software inside your browser, then the trusted computing base is all the software that your browser needs in order to contact your bank, communicate with your bank, render your uh, browser window on the screen and so on. And if you minimize the kernel, then you can also minimize the trusted computing base by basically removing 
all parts of the system that you don't really need for doing the job you want at the moment. So for instance, you might not want to have this access for your banking application because hey, you don't store stuff on disk, you could just communicate over the internet. So in a microkernel, you have the possibility to simply remove the whole file system from the trusted computing base for, for this specific scenario. Um, and then, as we will see later maybe, uh, microkernels are also suitable for formal verification, which means there are really people um, taking a microkernel and doing some kind of a mathematical proof that this microkernel is co correctly implemented and really does what it is supposed to do, which is a really hard thing, but uh, it has been done already. Um, in a microkernel architecture, instead of putting everything into this whole blob, uh, as we did in Linux, um, we split up the functionality of the system. We have a very small kernel at the base, and uh, most stuff that we move out of the kernel um, is simply running in user space as a normal application, and we call these applications service, because um, a gen in general, a microkernel system is a client-server architecture where programs talk to services uh, that provide certain services like a device driver or a file system or a TCP stack and so on. And splitting this up also makes the whole design uh, pretty flexible and extensible. So if you don't need a component, you just throw it out. If you don't trust the component, you just replace it with your own trusted implementation. And the rest of the system can simply remain um, unmodified. And the ultimate goal of microkernels is that by implementing the system in such a way, the system gets both more secure and more resilient. You get more secure because you have uh, more isolation between the sub-components sub of your operating system, and you get more resilient because if, if your components are isolated and one component crashes, then you simply restart it and you don't need to uh, reboot the whole system, but only restart the single component that crashed. Um, that's the uh, standard layout of a microkernel-based system, so it kind of mimics the one from the uh, monolithic kernel I showed you before. We still have a, something running in kernel mode, and there's still a system called interface, there's uh, still hardware access, and there are a few mechanisms which need to provide it, be provided by the kernel in order to implement the rest of the system. However, um, the largest part of a uh, monolithic kernel, which is uh, file system, networking, memory management, and especially device drivers, have been moved out of kernel mode, and they are now running as user-level applications on top of the kernel. And this is the general idea of a microkernel, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the rest of my lectures. So, a short history of microkernel-based systems. Um, the idea is not new. So basically, the, the first generation of microkernels has been implemented back in the 1980s, um, and what, uh, the most uh, prominent instance of such microkernels was the Mach microkernel implemented at CMU. And Mach claims to have invented the whole concept, which is not necessarily true, but it was the first popular implementation of a microkernel. And um, the interesting part about Mach is that it's still alive, and Mach basically became uh, the foundation for an operating system uh, called Next OS which is now serving as the basic uh, kernel foundation for Mac OS X. So if you're running an Apple computer, uh, then basically you're working on top of a microkernel, even, even though you don't really see that anymore these days. Um, Mach and uh, its companions had a few problems, and one of the problems of the Mach microkernel was, was that it was terribly slow. And so um, people basically came up with the idea that microkernels seem to be a good idea in terms of engineering, However, in terms of practicality, uh, they don't really work because they are so slow. And this was disproven in the second generation of microkernels, where people w really went there and started implementing microkernels that were really, really uh, fast. And the second generation microkernels include both the L4 uh, family of microkernels as well as something, for instance, called Minix 3. Uh, Minix 3 is an interesting microkernel as well, because for, for one it was done by a guy called Andrew Tannenbaum, who is a quite famous professor for operating systems. And uh, on the other thing is they also implemented the first microkernel based system that really uh, focused on restarting crashed applications. So they proved the fact that you can build a microkernel based system 
that when one component fails because of a software error, uh, does not crash the whole system, but instead you simply can restart the component and the system keeps running. Um, anyway, still second generation microkernels are also some kind of the past these days, and we're now in kind of the third generation of microkernels. Um, and this includes a lot of kernels from the F4 microkernel family, which we are also doing here in Dresden. And the most prominent feature of third generation microkernels is that not, they are not only fast, but they also include um, very cool uh, security mechanisms, as we will see later in this lecture. So um, here's a short timeline of the F4 family of microkernels. So basically, uh, what we see is that the, the root starts somewhere at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany. So actually, it doesn't start in Karlsruhe, but in some other place in Germany, with uh, kernels called L2 and L3. And they were done by a guy named Jochen Liedke. And the L stands for Liedke, which is, was his name. And L2 was obviously his second kernel, and L3 was his third one. And they became the predecessors to what was the first uh, microkernel implementation done by him, and this was L4 version 2, um, down here. And Jochen Liedke then went on to become professor at the University of Karlsruhe, and the University of Karlsruhe then developed a couple of other kernels later on, uh, which were X0 and then X2 or version 4. And on this slide, uh, one thing to notice, you see um, orange boxes and blue boxes. Uh, blue boxes are implementations of kernels, and orange boxes are specifications of kernels. So in L4 there's some kind of a um, weird uh, and probably not, not easy to comprehend a variety of different kernels and implementations and specifications. And so for instance uh, you have the L4 pistachio uh, specification down here, and there are implementation, implementations of it which are X2, there's version 4, and there's something else called N1. Um, and they all implement the L4KA pistachio specification. Um, anyway, if we're moving to N1, we see that this has been done somewhere else. It was at the University of New South Wales, which is in Australia. And basically, these guys split off from the L4X2 kernel and started doing uh, or focusing especially on embedded systems. So they ported um, the L4 kernels to, to various embedded systems, uh, most prominently to ARM. And then they had another implementation called N2, which implemented their own embedded pistachio specification. And from this on, uh, their two current implementations stem. One, one is called SEL4, the other one is called OKL, OKL4. Um, and these are also famous. SEL4 is the one they use for verification. And it has, has become famous because it was the first microkernel um, that was formally verified. And this was done like two years ago where they finished their effort and took them like three or four years to just do this for a very small implementation of this microkernel. But now they have a proof that this microkernel really functions as it should. And on the, on the other hand, the OKL4 kernel these guys have been doing is uh, one of the commercial successful things. And uh, the first deal they had was with a company called Qualcomm, which is providing um, processors for mobile phones in the Asia Pacific uh, area and basically OKL4 is the microkernel that's running on the GM GSM stack in pretty much any mobile phone you find in China, Japan and Southeast Asia these days. Um, also, uh, rumors have it that OKL4 is running on the GSM stack of the iPad um, but this hasn't been confirmed because Apple is kind of secretive about it. Um, so this is the Australian guys. Um, and then we have TU Dresden, which is us down here. So TU Dresden had an implementation of L4 called uh, Fiasco pretty early. So Fiasco was released in 1997, which is 15 years ago. And uh, Fiasco had the feature that it was the first implementation of a microkernel in a high-level programming language. So Fiasco was implemented in C++ and still is. And it has evolved over the years, and these days we're not working on plain old Fiasco anymore, but we're working on something called Fiasco OC, which is the kernel I'm going to talk about. And we have also have another kernel called Nova, which is especially focused on virtualization on x86 32-bit. Um, but I'm going to leave that out for, the, for this lecture. So Fiasco OC is the kernel we are currently working on in Dresden, and the operating system around it and this is what the main focus of my talk is going to be.
So let's move to microkernel concept. Um, Jochen Liebke, the uh, inventor of the L4 microkernel, once phrased uh, or summed it up with the sentence, a microkernel does no real work. So what he was saying then was, uh, you don't do any actual work in the kernel. All actual work is performed by user level applications. And the kernel only provides you with the mechanisms that you need to implement those things. And what this means is the kernel, for instance, also does not enforce any policy. So the kernel does not enforce if you're allowed to read or write a file. The kernel only provides you with the means that if you are allowed to write a file that you can access the disk. And the, all the checks you need to do beforehand if you are allowed to implement some kind of security policies or scheduling or whatever um, are implemented in user level applications, giving you all the benefits of security and isolation and resilience and so on. Um, the question now is, what are these inevitable mechanisms that you need in order to uh, implement a system on top of a microkernel? And basically it comes down to uh, four things. We have two abstractions in Fiasco, which uh, are called threads and edge spaces. So a thread is the typical thing what you expect the thread to be. It's like a um, unit of execution on the CPU. And an address space, or a task as we call it sometimes, is um, a unit of isolation. It's like kind of a virtual memory space that belongs to one process or one program and it's isolated from the rest of the system. And then we have mechanisms. Uh, the most important mechanism is communication. So all threads in the system need to communicate with each other in order to achieve their goal. And in addition to that, because an operating system is also responsible for um, managing resources and uh, multiplexing resources between programs, um, we have a second mechanism that allows to um, implement resource management, and we call this resource mapping. Um, and finally, there's another mechanism in the kernel and fiasco, which is called scheduling. And this kind of contradicts what I just told you, because scheduling actually is the policy. Because if you're a scheduler, you need to decide who is going to run on the CPU at a certain point in time. And if we go back to Jochen Liebke's original sentence, then this policy certainly does not belong into the kernel. However, um, if you try to implement a scheduler as a user-level application, then you run into all kinds of problems. One thing is that your kernel now depends on an application running in user space, which may be attacked by some outside attacker. And the other thing is that uh, the, uh, the interaction between the kernel and this user's level scheduler becomes um, pretty heavyweight, and so uh, scheduling in user space becomes slow. And because no one has yet solved all these problems together, uh, scheduling is still the one policy that is implemented inside the kernel just because it makes the kernel faster. Um, I told you that Fiasco, uh, or the Fiasco implementation we're working on is called Fiasco OC. And it's now time to talk about what the OC stands for. And OC actually means Object Capability System, which probably does not ring the bell to anyone yet. Um, object Capability System means that um, the whole operating system that you're working with and that your applications work with consists of some kind of set of objects that are providing certain services and that communicate with each other. So for instance, you can have some kind of client application uh, and a service implementation in here, over here in service one and the, what the system provides you with is some way to start all, or create these objects and manage them and then some way to interact between the objects so that the client is able to call the service in provided by service one. And at some other point in time, service one might also want to use another service provided by some service two, in which case service one is basically taking over um, the client role in the system and service two is the server over here. And this fundamentally how a system on top of Fiasco works. You have your kind of objects which are implemented as separate applications and these objects call each other in order to get some service provided and the kernel provides you with me mechanisms to create objects and to interact between the objects. Um, so now as we see calling one object from another um, actually is like the most important thing you do in a microkernel based system. And Every time we have something like we want to call a certain object, we need an address for this object. And if you think about calling someone on the phone, you need a telephone number to 
actually call your friend over there. If you want to write a letter, you need to post an address. If you want to call a website in the internet, you need the IP address for this website. Otherwise, this won't work. So what you ha want to have in a, as a communication service provided by your kernel is you want to have some function where a client calls um, and specifies some kind of ID, for instance, an ID for service one. And then the kernel translates this call into a message sent to the proper implementation of this. Uh, service. And of course, on the other hand, if this service does not exist, the kernel should return an error message such, such as A non existent um, in order to notify you that the service isn't there. The problem now is that this again bears security issues. So, one thing is if you have global IDs that are uh, distributed across the system, then even if you don't know an ID, you can simply guess it. It's pretty much like brute forcing IP addresses on the internet. You can simply try to connect to any kind of website by guessing an IP address and see if there's a web server answering to your requests. And that's of course a security issue because then you might able to contact someone which you are not supposed to contact. And so if you want to have a really secure system which with isolated components and if you want to control um, who is able to communicate with each other, then global IDs are not a good idea. Um, the other point is, if you take this a step further, um, even the knowledge about if an, a service exists or not is already one bit of information. And you can use this one bit of information to implement something called the covert channel, which is some kind of more theoretical concept in uh, security research. And covert channels basically mean you have some um, not obvious communication channels between two objects which are not supposed to communicate. And so, for instance, you could have some service um, register itself under a certain ID and then revoke this registration later on and you could periodically do this and some other, ser uh, some other client might just query if this, registration, uh, if this service has been registered under a certain ID or not. And if this registration is there, then the bit you want to read is 1. If the registration is not there, uh, the bit is 0. And if you do this 100 times a second with unregistering and registering and querying, then you can send 100 bits a second, basically. And no one will be able to prevent you from doing that. And the whole reason for that is that there are global IDs where everyone has a globally assigned ID which everyone else uses to call him up. Um, our solution to uh, solve this problem is to add another layer of indirection, which is called a capability. And basically, a capability is a reference to an object. And uh, you may imagine the capability to be something like a pointer to an object you want to invoke. Or you may think of it like a file descriptor in uh, Linux, where you open the file with a globally unique name. But later on, you interact with this file only with a file descriptor you obtain. So reading and writing to this file then works over this file descriptor. And this file descriptor is unique to your application. If some other application opens a file descriptor in Linux, then it may have a different file descriptor, or a, so that the file descriptor may have a different number than the one you are using. Um, what this allows us to do is to have globally unique names only known to the kernel. Uh, so, for instance, in this uh, example over here, we have a service that has some kind of a communication channel that others can use to communicate with the service. However, this communi communication channel is only known to the kernel and to no one else. And capabilities now um, add a reference to this um, channel or to this object um, into a per task capability table. So every process that is running on top of Fiasco has a capability table. This capability table is basically a list of uh, objects this task has access to, similar to the file descriptor table in Linux. And um, a client now only um, accesses an object by invoking a capability uh, in its capability space, and the client has no control over what actual object is behind this capability. So in this example, the client does an invoke on capability 3, and only what, the only thing the client knows is that there is some object in slot 3 in the capability table, and that its message will be redirected to this object, but the client has no knowledge about where this object is and what happens to it. So because this knowledge is only implemented in the kernel, and only the kernel sees the whole mapping between uh, capability number 3 for the client and this communication channel. 
Um, and this indirection actually allows you to implement a secure system because, for instance, um, the kernel could simply replace uh, this communication channel with a communication channel pointing to another object and the client would not notice. And thereby you could, for instance, modify or inspect communication going on in your system or you could redirect messages sent by a client to someone else. And this capability concept is pretty fundamental to the understanding of Fiasco OC. And what you need to take away from this slide is that every application has its own capability table and you interact with objects in the system not by directly calling these objects but by calling them through a capability you obtained beforehand. Um, now that we want to build the system on top of Fiasco, um, every, every operating system has kind of um, one sentence that sums everything up. So for instance, in Unix, everything is a file and all interaction that's going on in Unix is kind of opening a file and reading and writing this file and then later closing this file. And Fiasco, this philosophy is called everything is an object. I already told you that the whole system contains of objects that provide certain services and that are isolated from each other. And the good thing is that with this concept, you only need one system call. And this system call is called invoke object. Um, and the parameters to the system call depend on what kind of object you are interacting with. And they are passed through something called a UTCP, which I'm going to explain later on. And then the, the whole system is split up into some objects that are provided by the kernel and that correspond to the abstract mechanisms the kernel provides. So for instance, the kernel provides address spaces and the threads. So there are of course kernel objects for threads and for tasks. There are also kernel objects for interrupts if you want to talk to a device. And in addition to that, uh, user level applications implement arbitrary other objects as whatever they see fit. And uh, these objects are implemented through something called some generic, generic communication object called the IPC gate. And the IPC gate is simply the communication channel I showed you on the previous site. And there's a sender site which everyone who has the capability for this IPC gate can send a message to. And there's a receiver site which only one thread um, has access to and this thread is then able to receive the messages that come through this gate. And Using this concept, you can basically implement arbitrary services on top of this communication object, and um, that's, that's what we use to implement a client-server architecture on top of Fiasco. Um, when we talk about Fiasco, or microkernels in general, we need to be aware that uh, Fiasco, as the microkernel itself, is not a full-fledged operating system. <coughs> Sorry. Because um, if, you're talking, if you're talking about an operating system, then of course people expect things like a file system, they expect um, network communication, they expect, expect some kind of uh, interaction with devices and device drivers. And all these features are not inside the kernel. So Fiasco is only a kernel, but not an operating system. And therefore, here in Dresden, we develop an operating system uh, or a set of user-level components that make up an operating system um, that runs on top of Fiasco. And this set of operating system components is called the L4 runtime environment, or short L4RE. And L4RE consists of a couple of SERP. So um, the L4 runtime environment provides this basic resource managing service and services to start new applications. And in addition to that, we have a couple of libraries that you'd expect on a standard system to implement your application. So we have a C library, we have a standard C++ library, which allows you to basically use all the primitives you are uh, used to when programming C and C++. And we have a couple of other services which are more focused on the microkernel part. Uh, so for instance, there's a client-server framework for implementing clients and servers uh, on top of IPC. And we're going to talk about this in my Friday, Friday lecture. Um, so yeah, at the next lectures. So today and on Friday, we're going to talk about um, the basic kernel objects provided by Fiasco OC. So today I'm going to introduce um, threads, which are the basic unit of execution. And on Friday, we're going to talk about communication and about memory. And then once we're done with that, um, we're going to talk about some specific services in the F4 runtime environment, namely uh, device drivers and our virtualization implementation called F4 Linux.
So let's move over to the first abstraction and move over to threads. Um, threads are pretty much what you expect them to be from uh, your, your favorite programming environment. So a thread is some kind of abstraction of execution. It's the unit used for CPU scheduling. And so um, in terms of isolation, threads are kind of temporarily isolated because only one thread can run on the CPU at a single point of time. But threads are not isolated in terms of memory, for instance. So th there may be multiple threads running in the same address space. And so they share data. They can cooperate by reading and writing the same data. Uh, of course, in um, connection with all the problems involved with that. Um, the Fiasco microkernel provides uh, threads as um, basic objects. And there are a couple of properties managed by the kernel. And these co properties are things like uh, the instruction pointer, which tells us at which point in code this thread currently is. Every thread has, of course, a stack. So there's a stack pointer managed by the kernel. And whenever threads are um, scheduled, which means they are either removed from the CPU or moved to the CPU, um, the kernel saves and restores the thread's uh, CPU registers, the CPU flags, and some additional area uh, called the user level thread control block, or short UTCB. Um, in addition to that, if you want to implement a thread and use this, this thread, you need some more stuff. So for instance, um, you don't only need a stack pointer, but you also need memory that is backing this stack. And allocation of this memory is not part of what the kernel does. So this is something a user-level application needs to perform. Also, um, threads or the code of a thread comes from some kind of application binary. And loading this binary and figuring out where the thread needs to start from is also not part of what the kernel does. And this is also done in a user-level component. And so if you really want to use threads, you need some additional user-level support to do so. Um, threads, usually if you program them, run in userland and enter the kernel in two ways. Either they perform a system call, which can be sysenter or int 30 hex, um, depending on what kind of platform you're running on. So sysenter and n the int version are both ways of entering the kernel on x86 computers. And depending on what kind of x86 platform you're on, uh, either sysenter or int 0x30 is uh, the more efficient way to do so. And the kernel actually provides you with a way to detect which is more efficient at, the po at this point in time. Um, the other way to enter the kernel is whenever some kind of hardware interrupts or CPU exceptions happen. And this is just uh, owed to the hardware architecture because whenever something like this happens, uh, the CPU automatically switches to privileged mode and performs some kind of handling for this interrupt or exception. And this is what's done in the kernel, and the thread that is currently running in user space is interrupted at this point. Um, there is some global kernel info page which is provided by the kernel. And this is kind of a magic memory page that appears in every task that you run on top of Fiasco. And this kernel info page uh, provides you with some kernel related information like you can figure out on what kernel version you are running on, what kind of features were configured into the kernel, and in addition to that it also calls the code to actually enter the system. And it, this basically means that the kernel can switch the um, system call entry code and for instance decide whether you want to use sysenter or int 0x30 depending on your platform, and the user-level applications don't need to care about this. They simply need to know that if they want to enter the kernel, there is a magic address on the kernel info page, and they simply need to jump to this address, and then any, whatever code is in there um, will make them enter the kernel and perform a system call. And this mechanism is pretty much what you also find in other operating systems. For instance, Linux in most of the recent versions has uh, this feature called the vsyscall page, which is pretty much the same thing. So the Linux kernel or some uh, dynamic library provided along with your Linux kernel provides you with a memory page that contains the code to enter the kernel. Um, I already mentioned this thing called the thread control block. And this is basically a data structure that is um, used by the kernel to store thread-related information such as the thread registers and instruction pointer and stack pointer and so on uh, that I told you about before. 
every thread has its own thread control block, of course, and the kernel manages them uh, on a per thread basis. And uh, there is an extension to the kernel level thread control block, which is called the user level thread control block. And this user level thread control block stores additional data uh, that the kernel does not necessarily need to keep private to itself, but which it can also expose to um, the user level threads. And this user level thread control block is again mapped to every thread, and every thread can obtain the address of its user level thread control block and read and write to it. And the user level thread control block is, for instance, used for performing system calls because all the system call parameters uh, that you need in order to do the system call go into this user level thread control block. And then you call uh, the magic uh, address that makes you enter the system, and the kernel then figures out okay, this was the thread performing a system call, and the parameters are somewhere over there in the user level thread control block. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, Jeffco uses this priority-based scheduling scheme, which means every thread has a priority assigned, and um, the kernel always selects the thread with the highest priority to run until something happens. And something is either that the thread's current time quantum runs out, so there, there's a limited amount of time a thread may consume, which allows you to scale, schedule several threads at the same priority and then distribute the CPU among them equally. Um, other points where another thread is chosen is, are either when the thread blocks, for instance if it performs a system call which does not immediately return but requires some other work to finish first, and then of course this thread is not ready to run anymore and we're selecting someone else. And the last thing is that whenever a thread with a higher priority becomes ready, then this thread is going to run. So the F4 runtime environment provides you with uh, ways of creating and managing uh, threads provided by Fiasco. So there are a couple of uh, thread-related system calls provided. For instance, there's a thread control system call, which uh, is used by Fiasco to modify a thread's properties, for instance, the priority used for scheduling. There is another call, th uh, system call called thread stats time, which you use to get your current runtime, so this, can you, this is something you can use to measure how long your thread was running. Um, and one of the more important thread-related system calls is called x regs where uh, you are allowed to modify a thread's instruction pointer and stack pointer. So this is how, you, for instance, you initially create and run a thread. First you create a kernel-level thread object, and then you use the thread x regs system call to give this new kernel object an instruction pointer and a stack pointer so that this thread can start executing and has a stack to run on. Um, however, when you are implementing applications on top of L4RE, you usually don't need to care about how fiasco threads work. Because, as I told you, the L4 runtime environment comes with um, a couple of libraries, and one of those is a C library containing a full implementation of libp threads. And so, if you're Usually, if you're working with threads on the top of F4RE, you're using the common pthread interface that you're used from programming on Linux, and you're going to be pretty fine with that. Um, so, threads, unit of execution. However, if we are talking about applications, then an application is more than a thread, because an application also needs an address space, which needs to be managed. And usually, an application also needs some kind of a binary that's containing the code that's going to run in this application. So, whenever you start an application on top of F4RE, you start with a completely empty address space, which is provided by the kernel. So, that's the task kernel abstraction. And the address space is managed by the parent of this application. And the parent always is the application that created this current application. Um, and whenever something happens to this application, the parent will get notifications about that. So, for instance, when the application exits or when it raises certain CPU exceptions and so on. Um, there's going to be one initial thread in every L4RE application. And this thread is the one that you create from the application's binary. L4RE, as I told you already, contains a binary loader, which basically is able to take an arbitrary ELF binary and load it into an application and start it. And this ELF loader will set up um, an initial stack for this first thread, 
and it will get the red instruction pointer and code from the ELF binary that you provide them with, and then it will run it. And in addition, in addition to that, um, every FRE application also gets an initial set of capabilities. Because, you know, um, we're interacting with objects here, and of course, if we want to interact with objects, we, we need a couple of objects to begin with. Otherwise, the application wouldn't be able to do anything. <coughs> and these an object, uh, for one, there's a, a communication channel to the thread's parent. Um, there's a capability for something called a memory allocator, which you can use to obtain new uh, memory. There's a capability for the main thread, so you always know which is the initial thread in your application and you can use it. And more importantly, there's a log capability, because if we're writing the first application I and mean, any kind of new programming language or any kind of new system, we're going to write something called Hello World. And for Hello World, of course, we need something to print out a message, and for this, we can use the log capability. So here's what we need to do in order to perform a system call now on top of it or from an FORE application. Um, all system calls uh, you can or on top of Fiasco is talking about how to do a system call. And there are a couple of um, wrapper functions provided by a library inside the FORE runtime environment. And these wrapper functions are called inter-process communication functions and usually start with start their name with something called F4 underscore IPC underscore something. Um, we, we can, offer, of course, refer to these functions as L4, IPC, whatever, send, call, receive. Um, however, the colloquial way to call it is just invoke. So whenever I say I invoke an object, I simply mean I send an, a message to this object and wait for a reply. Um, there are a couple of generic parameters for every system call. So uh, these are passed in registers to the kernel whenever you invoke the kernel. Um, one register contains the capability you want to invoke. Which, mean, which is the object you want to talk to. Uh, another register contains something like a timeout, which allows you to specify that you want to block only a certain amount of time until you want to reply for your system call. And if you don't get a reply for the system call until this amount of time, then you will receive an error telling you that your timeout ran out. Um, I'm going to talk about timeouts in more detail in the second lecture. Um, for now, let's just assume we're using something like a for IPC never, which means uh, we want to don't want to or we, we want to block infinitely, and we don't want to get woken up because some kind of time ran out. Um, and furthermore, there, there's something called a message tag, which just takes the rest of the message. And this message tag basically is, allows you to either or f to specify two things. One is um, what kind of uh, protocol you're actually talking right now. And uh, this protocol is something like a user-defined user uh, way of saying, I'm expecting to talk to something like a file server, for instance. And then the recipient of uh, this message, the, the one who's implementing the object you're currently talking to, um, can check if he's actually implementing this protocol. So is this really a file server that you're talking to or not? And if it is not, it can return an error without interpreting the rest of your message. And the second part of the message tag describes how large your message actually is. Because the actual message depends on what kind of object you're talking to, and it may have a different amount of parameters you want to send. And all these parameters go into the UTC, as I explained before. And the message tag then tells the kernel and the recipient of the message how many of the words inside the UTCB are actually valid data and how many simply don't need to be touched. The reason for this is that the UTCB is some static area that is never changed at all by the kernel after creation and it may contain a fixed amount of data, however you don't always need this fixed amount of data for every call. Usually you only need a couple of uh, integer values that are put into the UTCB and the amount of the interpretation of these values depends on what you're currently uh, talking to and the message tag allows you to tell the kernel, okay, ignore all the rest of the message, only take the first two integer values, for instance. So, uh, I'm going to come to an example of performing a system call right now and this example is, of course, going to be uh, how to implement Hello World on top of uh, Fiasco. And 
I told you already that every F4ROE application gets a log capability passed through its environment. And this log capability is a communication channel to some external entity that's implementing logging. And by default, this entity um, is, from, is inside the program loader and simply writes all the messages you, you put in there um, onto the serial line so that you can see it later on. Um, the protocol for that, that or underline pro under, underline log, and all this implement inside the kernel and wrote, written to the serial console. Um, and it, the UTCB content for this specific protocol contains three parts. Uh, the first part, or the first uh, register or integer value in the UTCB, um, asks or specifies which kind of log operation you want to perform. And actually, there is only one important thing you want to perform with a log object, which is write something. So what you write in there is the um, value L4 beacon write operation. Um, the second integer value in the UTCP specifies the number of characters you want to send with your message. And all the rest, starting from the third uh, integer value until the very end of the UTCP, are then the characters that you really want to write to the console. So that's the basic protocol. Uh, let's have a look at how this looks like in code. Um, so here's some, some separate code to make in your assignment later on. Um, we include some important um, header files over here. So the first one gets you access to your L4 runtime environment environment, which contains all the important um, capabilities um, for your system. The second thing uh, includes L4 sysipc.h, which is the header file specifying with, uh, the functions used for system calls. And then we can we can write this code. So first we can obtain a pointer to our L4 environment containing all the uh, basic capabilities. Um, the second is we can obtain a pointer to the message registers inside our UTCB. And the message registers basically are what you use to specify um, the system call parameters. And then in the next step we fill in uh, values into these message registers. And as I told you before, for the uh, log uh, in the first register, we write L4 beacon write off. In the second register, we write the amount of characters we want to write. In our case, we want to write hello and a new line character, which is six characters plus a um, terminated zero, so that's seven characters. And then starting from message register number three, um, we want to write the string hello. So what we do is we do a mem copy into this location with this string and seven bytes or characters. So now we now set up the uh, ECB to perform a system call here. We can actually do that. And in order to do the system call, we still need an additional uh, message tag. And the message tag is a data structure that is built from a couple of parameters. First parameter specifies the protocol, which is L4 proto lock, as I told you before. The second parameter is the number of message words we want to send. And message words basically means the number of integer values in the UTCB's message registers that are valid at this point. And this, this means we have one integer value for the operation, we have one for the number of characters, and then we have all these characters. And these characters are seven characters, which we can round up to eight characters, because this is a multiple of four. And on 32 bits, this is the word size. So the message actually is two more uh, integer values. So this sums up to four words we're going to send through the system call. The third parameter of the message tag can be left to zero, and I'm going to explain what this is for in a later lecture. And the last parameter specifies the timeout for the system call, which, as I told you, for now we let the L4 IPC never, so we don't want to, want to have any timeout, we just want to wait until this message has been done. Um, and then in the last line down here, we call L4 IPC send, which is one of the wrappers system calls. And here we pass in three parameters. One is um, a, the capability want to, we want to communicate with. And here we use the environment pointer we obtained in the first line of code. And this is uh, a pointer to the actual log object. So this is the log capability we use here. 
The second parameter specifies the UTCB to be used. So it's the current UTCB, so it's the pass L4 underlying UTCB in there. And the third parameter is the message tag we want to use for our message, which is the one we just built together in the line above. And this function call will actually perform the system call. So in the end, it's going to write hello uh, with a new line to the string. And then afterwards, we can do some uh, error handling. So we, there is a function to actually check if the return value of this system call contains an error. And if it would do this, we'd have to uh, perform some error handling. And this is pretty much all the code you need to perform a system call. However, if you're talking about real code, um, I told you we have a C library, and the C library contains functions such as printf and puts and so on. So if you want to write real code and want to write something to your log uh, object, don't do the hard thing I just explained to you, but just write something like puts hello, and you'll be done as well. Okay, let's move on. Um, I told you that Fiasco allows multi-threading, which means you can have multiple threads attached to, this, to a single address space, and they all share this address space, which uh, means they also share all data that's stored in there, and they may be even spread across multiple physical CPUs if you have a multi-core system. And this has leads to a classical problem. When you have multi-threading, you have critical sections. And here's an example of a critical section where we have a global variable, int i, which is zero, and then we have two threads which perform this code here, so both do the same thing. Um, we have some kind of um, loop that's running from 0 to 10, and in every loop step we increment the variable i by 1. And this is done by thread 1 and by thread 2 in parallel. And what would expect to happen is what would happen if we ran this in sequence, so if we first ran thread 1 and then ran thread 2, then the result, of course, would be that the global variable i would be set to 20, because every thread increments i 10 times, so we're ending up with 20. However, if you're running this in a parallel system and thread 1 and 2 run in parallel, then the result is actually rarely 20, but most of the time you're going to be somewhere below 20, because you're missing updates there. And this is what's called a critical section, because in this increment operation, both threads access the same resource. And what's going to happen is they read the variable, increment it, and write it back. And in the meantime, the other thread may still have read the old value and uh, wrote, uh, incremented it and wrote it back. And so we're missing updates there. And this is something we need to avoid. And in a traditional system, um, we, we would need to come up with some kind of way of protecting this uh, critical section. And one thing you could do is you could disable interrupts, for instance, because disabling interrupts would prevent you from being interrupted within this loop. And so you'd be sure that uh, your increments go on unmodified without anyone else interfering. However, disabling interrupts is not allowed for user space applications. Only something you can do inside the kernel. So we cannot do this for us. Um, there are th things like spin logs uh, available which you also find in Linux and several other things. However, uh, spin logs have the problem that uh, they kind of check a log all the time until the log uh, becomes free. And so you're having some kind of a loop where you read uh, the same value all the time, which burns CPU time in an embedded system, more importantly, which also burns energy. And it also burns the time quanta if you're talking about a real-time si real system. So that's not the optimal thing to do. Um, what we really want to have is something like a blocking log, which at the beginning of the critical section you say, um, I want to enter this critical section and I want to not be interrupted and I want no one else to be in this critical section right now. And if this is the case, then you simply go on and do whatever you need. However, if someone else is currently accessing the critical section, you want to block until he is done with whatever he is doing. So this is, what, uh, this is what's called a blocking log. And a blocking lock is what we really want here. Um, and at the end of the critical section, you obviously release the lock by saying, OK, I'm done now. Let the next one enter the critical section. Um, here's this uh, kind of visualized behavior. So we have our two threads running in parallel. And at some point, both threads reach the point where, where they want to enter this critical section in order to increment the variable i. And then what we want to he have is that first thread 1, for instance, can run while thread 2 is blocked down here. And then at some point, thread 1 leaves its critical section and continues running. 
And now that the critical section is free, thread 2 should get woken up, perform its work in the critical section, and then also leave the critical section and go on with whatever execution it needs to do. Um, so the standard way, I talk, we have the P threads on top of um, L4RE, so the standard way to do this in the P threads would be using some kind of a P thread mutex, where you'd have a global variable, again, P mutex, and then before incrementing uh, the global shared counter, you would um, call something like pthread mutex lock on the mutex, and after incrementing, you'd, have, you'd do a pthread mutex unlock, and so the pthread implementation would actually implement behavior that uh, is identical to what I showed you on the last slide. So you get this behavior using that. However, um, in addition to that, on top of our microkernel, using the messaging primitives provided by the microkernel, um, we can also have another solution which does not involve using any locks, but instead works using a serializer thread. And I'm just going to present you this idea. Um, and for now, I didn't talk about communication yet, because I'm doing this in the next, le next lecture. For now, simply assume communication is something where you can send messages between two threads. So for instance, thread one might send a message to thread two or to the serializer thread. And um, this communication is blocking, which means um, you can block in this set operation until the recipient sends you a reply message. So basically it's some kind of a remote procedure call you can do using the messaging primitives provided by Fiasco OC. And if we have something like that, then we can implement locking using a thread instead of a lock variable. And the locking then works by uh, thread one and thread two executing. And then when they want to enter the critical section, um, they both send a blocking message to the serializer thread. And the kernel will then queue this message because the serializer thread is only able to receive one message at a time. Uh, so the other thread will be blocked until later. And then the serializer will receive a message. So for instance, it will receive the message from thread one first, uh, send a reply saying, okay, you can enter the critical section. And then thread one executes its critical section. Whereas the message uh, uh, by thread two is not re uh, replied to by the serializer yet. Because the serializer is the one who knows uh, that this critical section is currently taken. And then thread one executes inside the critical section and at some point in time uh, sends a message to the serializer again saying, okay, I'm done with my critical work and I'm now going on and I don't need the critical section anymore. And at this point, the serializer wakes up and figures out, okay, there's another thread who's currently waiting uh, to enter the critical section. So now, only after this time has happened, um, the block call done by thread 2 in order to enter the critical section is replied to. And at this point, thread 2 gets woken up by the kernel and can execute using the critical section and so on. Um, so what I showed you here is you can get the same behavior of protecting critical section um, by using an additional thread instead of using some kind of global uh, lock implementation. And the cool thing is that the kernel mechanism for communicating between threads is already there and you don't need to implement anything about it because the kernel already provides it. And this mechanism provides you with a feature to block, it provides you with some kind of queue so that with multiple threads want to enter a critical section that queued until someone uh, else uh, tells them they can go on, and that would need a lock implement implementation if we had locking communication in a microkernel at this point. We talk about the uh, practical assignment for today and tomorrow. Um, so I'd like you to uh, download Fiasco and FRE and get it compiled and run it inside QEMU. That's basically the practical assignment. Um, there's a link over here. Uh, where you can find download and build instructions for both the Fiasco microkernel and the L4 runtime environment. And this basically uh, includes checking things out using Subversion and then compiling it. Um, we will use the 32-bit versions of Fiasco and L4 RE for this course. Um, you don't have to do anything about it. Um, the only thing you need to do is to download and build it. And at the points where you're configuring uh, anything, simply leave all the con uh, default configuration settings on and you're going to end up with the right thing. Please note that you have to do separate builds. Um, is you have to, for one thing, you have to compile the microkernel and for the other thing, you have to compile the runtime environment 
Um, but uh, the instructions should be clear about this, and you should fi figure this out yourself. Um, and the last thing to note, if your computer is too modern and has a GCC 4.7 installed, then please don't use it. Use something below for it. So for GCC 4.6 works perfectly fine. Um, older versions should be working as well. Uh, however, 4.7 has a couple of compilation issues, at least in the public subversion uh, version we're providing. Um, yeah, some rules on the directory structure. So you're going to check out the whole source code of L4. And with, this means you're going to end up with a couple of uh, directories. And there are some that are important and some are not. Um, the most important thing you're going to look at is uh, the directory called source slash L4 which has two important subdirectories. One is called pkg, or package, and the other thing is called con. And package contains all the applications and libraries and so on that come with the runtime environment. So everything that fits into a single application or into a single library is what we put into a package, similar to uh, packages of your favorite Linux distribution, for instance. Um, packages usually also have subdirectories called uh, server, lib, and include. These are the important ones. So server usually contains the implementation of some kind of a program. Lib contains some kind of library, which clients of this server might use in order to communicate with the server. And include contains header files, which may be shared between clients and the server itself. So that's, that's just for a general overview. You're going to see that if you're downloading stuff and have a look at the code. Um, for running the whole stuff, once you compile it, we're going to use QEMU, which is a virtual machine which runs on Linux and basically emulates a computer and you can use run arbitrary operating systems in there. Um, and the good news is um, L4RE's build system comes with QEMU support, which means you, you don't have to do a lot. Uh, all you need to do is you need to modify uh, two files in L4.conf. Uh, one is a modules LST file, which basically describes um, what binaries you need to boot in your current setup. I'm going to show you an example soon. And the second one is something called makeconf.boot, which contains the overall settings like which uh, binary you want to use for QEMU, where in which directory can we find the binaries you want to boot, and so on. Let's start with the modules list. Um, this is the most simple one you're going to use. So the initial line is something like mod address with some pretty large hex number. Uh, you need this one, once in your file, and this is actually used by the um, Fiasco bootloader to place the binaries at some location during boot up. And I'm going to detail this boot process a bit more in the next lecture. For now, just copy this line into your modules LST file and you're done. And then the modules LST files contains a bunch of entries. And these entries always have a name. In this case, we have an entry called hello. And the next lines then describe which applications should be loaded along with this entry. So um, the first line of an entry has something like root task, mo, dash dash init, rom, slash hello. Um, root task describes what the initial application you want to boot is. And usually you're going to use mo here because this is the initial resource manager and program loader provided by the F4 runtime environment. And that there's a command line option here, dash dash init, which tells Mo what the actual init script or init application is you're going to run. So init, as in Linux, is the first application you're going to start after um, the system is booted up. And this is then responsible for booting anything else. And in this case, we're just passing rom slash hello as uh, the init process to start. And in this case, rom slash hello is just going to be the hello world application. And we're not going to have any kind of script parsing and any kind of loading of additional applications. We simply want to load this single application so we can go by with that. Um, all the other lines after the root task line are so-called modules. And modules are basically additional files that are loaded during boot up and that are put into memory at some point. And the root task mo has got access to these modules. And any other applications, as well as Mo, can get access to the modules using a virtual file system, which is called ROM. So all the modules you put in here are later on at runtime available um, through this file system by simply opening ROM slash file name. 
So uh, for instance, over here in the root task command line, we see we're passing in rom slash hello as the init parameter. And this simply means go into your ROM file system and take a module or, or load an application called hello. And hello is this is exactly the application we're loading down here. And that's pretty much all for the modules list. And then there's the make the boot file, um, which you need to create yourself. However, there is an example file in l 4 conf which you can simply rename to makeconf.boot and basically the only thing you need to modify is a variable called module underline search underline path uh, which needs to contain the path to your fiasco.oc build directory uh, which is the, the directory where you compile the fiasco in. You're going to see that, you're going to create this during the build process and in the makeconf.boot file you need to specify which directory that is so that everything else works. Once you're done, so once you set up your modules LST file and your makeconf.boot, uh, you can start running QMU, which consists of simply going to the L4RE build directory and running something like make QMU, which will pop up a dialog uh, containing all the entries in your modules LST file. So in your case, if there's only the hello entry, there will be only one option, and you can simply press enter on this option and it will continue. Um, if you don't see a dialog, there's another package missing in your Linux installation, which is called Dialog. Um, and later on, if you're kind of bored by always seeing the Dialog, navigating to some entry and pressing Enter, you can also circumvent the Dialog by running make QMU with an additional option, uh, capital E equals a name. So for instance, for the hello entry, you could write capital, uh, make QMU capital E equals hello, and it would simply select the entry without popping up the Dialog later on. Um, so yeah, use the assignment, download and compile the stuff, get the hello world example which ships with our code uh, running in QMU, and once you're done with that, I want you to try out a system calls in L4RE. So I showed you this code beforehand, which is used to perform a system call and write hello to the log object, and I simply want you to replace the printf or puts call in the hello example with this code and see that you can ex achieve the same thing um, using that stuff. Um, in addition to that, I have three papers for you, which you might want to read, uh, which are concerning uh, microkernels in general. So there's uh, a very old paper, uh, published in 1970, so written probably in 1969 or even earlier, by a Danish guy called Green Chansen, and the paper is titled The Nucleus of Multi-Programming System, and this is basically the first scientific paper that comes up with an idea of implementing something like a microkernel. And so this is why also Mach, though it claims it was the first microkernel, Mach is by far not the first real microkernel. Um, and the real first microkernel is described in this paper. It's a pretty short read. However, there are a couple of uh, differences. So you see, uh, computer science has involved uh, nearly 50 years since then. And so some terminology used in this paper might be a bit different to what you'd expect today, but this makes the paper the more interesting. Um, the second paper I'd like to recommend is a paper by Jochen Liebke, the inventor of L4, uh, titled On Microkernel Construction. And this paper basically describes all the fundamental ideas that you find in L4 microkernels. And even though this paper also has been written like 20 years ago, it still contains a lot of things you're going to find even in today's L4 microkernels. So the concepts are still current, even though the implementations today might differ from what he describes in this paper. And the last historical paper I'd like to point you to is um, completely different from microkernels. It's called the Exokernel, an Operating System Architecture for Application Level Resource Management. And basically, the Exokernel is kind of an extremist paper in terms of operating system design. In contrast to microkernels, which have some kind of clever abstractions, but still feel like, so a microkernel, it, it, in addition to the user level components, still feels like the traditional operating system you're used to programming against. Whereas the exokernel takes the idea of moving policies out of the kernel to a very extreme, and they have the kernel only provides some kind of multiplexing of the underlying hardware, and then on top of that, you write user level applications which actually implement library operating systems. And it's a pretty crazy idea, and it's also worth reading.
this basically concludes my talk for today. Um, I'm going to probably send the uh, slides as a PDF to Vasily so he can put them on. And in addition to that, if you have any questions, so there is the forum, ask questions there. I'm going to check if there's anything wrong and if you need any help with the assignments. And furthermore, if you have further questions regarding FORE and Fiasco and so on, there's also a mailing list you will find on the FORE homepage. And uh, you can simply send messages in there as well and ask questions there. So, um, thank you all very much for your attention. Sorry for the technical issues. Um, <laughs>